For over a decade, the Chinese Communist Party has been butchering thousands of prisoners of conscience for their organs, one of the most horrific genocides in modern history. Doctors schedule an exact day that foreign patients get an organ, whereas in the US, it usually takes around two years to find a match. Welcome to the Coalition Roundtable. I'm your host, Chris Chappell. The Chinese Communist Party has been harvesting the organs of its citizens, prisoners of conscience. This has been a watershed year for the story, thanks in part to those who are joining me today. Let's talk a bit about the investigative process. How do we know this is happening? So are these live organ harvests? Yeah, always. Yeah. I mean, uh, organ transplantation in China is different from everywhere else in the world, because everywhere else in the world you're dealing either with live donors who, after the donation, are still alive. Brain-dead donors who are, are obviously brain-dead after the transplants as well. In China, you get people killed through the organ extraction, and that's only in China. How is uh, getting an organ in China different from anywhere else in the world? Nowhere else in the world, to, our, to my knowledge, is the donor killed in the process. If you get a kidney from X country, you're probably getting one kidney and somebody's being paid a certain amount of money. It's not good for their health, of course, but in China, the donor is dead and the body's burned. And that's something that people find very hard to accept. And from the patient experience, uh, there's a couple ways it's different. One is militarization. I mean, uh, you don't normally have military personnel operating uh, on you for a transplant elsewhere, but that's true in China. Another is they send you to the courts to figure out where to get the organ from. <laughs> or the courts don't normally serve as organ distribution centers anywhere else, but they, they certainly do in China. And another is, is the form of payment. It's often these red envelopes. You know, there's a lot of cash being thrown around high amounts. Uh, it just reeks of corruption and undercover activity. And don't we estimate that it's about eight or nine billion dollars a year they're getting now out of their industrial scale? That's a lot of people, a lot of salaries. Um, let's talk about the amount of time it takes to get an organ in the U.S. versus in China. In China, you show up, you tell them when you're coming in advance and say, I want to get an organ, and you can, you can book in advance, months in advance, if you want, a heart transplant, a liver transplant, whatever, a, a lung transplant, organs where obviously somebody has to be called for the organs because, you know, a donor can't live without the heart. So you can book for somebody else to be killed months in advance, and that doesn't happen anywhere else in the world. You did the bloody harvest, you did the slaughter. Why did you make an update? What we did for Bloody Harvest and the Slaughter is we just took the Communist Party of Chinese statements of volumes at face value. They said 10,000 years, so we started saying, okay, where does this come from, 10,000 a year? But at some point, we realized, well, I mean, they, they lie about everything else. Why would they be telling the truth about this? So uh, we decided we checked that figure as well. It was checkable because we could go to the individual hospitals, and the individual hospitals were telling how many many transplants they were doing, either their newsletters or research reports. Uh, we had bed counts, we had staff capacities, we had uh, budgets, so we had a lot of different figures to cross-check volumes, and we were able to see whether the 10,000 was real or not. Obviously, it's a lot of work because there was a thousand hospitals in China doing transplants, 169 of them were eventually registered officially as being allowed to do it, but there was a and uh, maybe 800 plus others that were also doing it. What we did, obviously with researchers, and a lot of them, is, is go through all this hospital data to get real volume figures rather than just Communist Party volume figures. I think, you know, the person who I thought explained all this best, of the various research methods that were coming out there, is Matt Robertson, mm -hmm. because he really went through, in a one article he did called A Hospital Bill for Murder, yeah, yeah. he went through comprehensively all the different approaches, or what he called guerrilla numbers, to establishing transplant It's a audience. brilliant article, Matt. Yeah, and that was on one hospital. I'm glad you brought that up. Matt, tell us about the Tianjin Hospital. I think our challenge all along has been to convince the diehard skeptics. And the original thought behind that was to try to bring this issue into one tangible thing that you can hold in your hand and kind of move around. So you feel a lot of the uh, information in the Bloody Harvest and the Slaughter it was not enough to convince the skeptics? Because it sounds like yeah, there's a I lot mean, of information all, out there that was just on the table. First of all, they don't read the stuff. <laughs> I mean, so that already makes it very difficult. Very difficult indeed. Um, just throw this away now. <laughs> <laughs> These diehard skeptics, they would, they would just not read the stuff we'll and then dismiss it. I've met with, um, with former senior people at 
um, major human rights organizations and they don't know that it's for real or they don't think it's for real. They're like, oh yeah, that issue. Yeah, but I thought it's like a bit, you know, thrown together. They don't have this idea that it's like totally for real. So where is that gap coming from? Because it is such a difficult issue to study. Like, if you look at any other major human rights issue in China over the last, like, 20 years or so, you know, for others, you've got, like, some document, for example, looking at orphanages in China that um, just, like, killed babies. Like, they let them starve to death in the cold. You know, in that case, there was someone who came out, like a doctor who escaped with a duffel bag of documents. And so that, like, you know, makes that one bulletproof. That was something that happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's totally extraordinary. This was like the biggest story, China human rights story. But like this one is like so crazy. You have to go about it systematically. So you have to whack like three, four, five moles at once because people always have these different objections to like, well, how do you know it's not death row? Like, how do you really know it's not death row? How do you really, really, really know it's not death row? Anyway, the Tianjin, the whole point of that was to eliminate objections. Just going by that one hospital, you can be like, if at least you can show that in this, in this hospital there's something really screwy going on, like first of all that there's way more transplants than can be explained by the official explanation, How many then transplants? you're already somewhere. Tianjin, we have figures on Tianjin. Yeah, I think yeah, it's about 4,000. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, we don't know. We can, we can say how many transplants. You say, look, probably this many. It's like completely estimates. If you say you can't know how many transplants this one hospital is doing, how do we know that yeah, there are more Because you can get a really 10, good 000. idea, because here's what you can do. You can be like, okay, so in 2006, they built a new building with 500 beds, 17 stories. It was, it was funded by the Tianjin government. 2006, like the next year, they moved a death row approval to the Supreme People's Court and they severely dropped the number of people on death row. So the first thing is you show the numbers are really big and so for example you've got like 500 beds and then the occupancy of those beds for kidney and liver transplants is like 90 percent. On their website they say the average waiting time is three to four weeks and so if you say you know you've got the beds are occupied to like you know 350 beds occupied at any one time and you can also cross-reference it with the surgeons they have there. So they've got like a massive surgical team like 60, 70 surgeons. They've got like their, you know, thick bios. It's not easy to be a transplant doctor. There's a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of work. Like you, it's a very specialized field of medicine. And so you, I mean, you just put all this together and the first thing you establish is that the volume is simply huge. So like any skeptics out there who are watching this, like they have to explain who else is being killed. So if they don't think like Falun Gong, this is, this is too crazy. Then it's like, okay, so who? And officially, China admitted to using executed prisoners. Well, they, they flipped around on that. Uh, originally, they said it was all donations. Then they said it was almost all executed prisoners. And now they're back to saying it's all donations. And it's not possible that uh, donations, like they, they've implemented a donation system, and that's why... It, yeah, I mean, this, that's of, of January 2015. So, like, everything about this is very hard to study. So, like, for example, we know after 2015 that this persisted because, for example, you've got people making phone calls and they're able to nail down, like, um, you know, they've got people saying, yeah, we've got a week. And so some could be lying, but when you do that to 20 hospitals and they're all saying, you know, we've got organs, then you know that it's still going on. We had callers calling donation centers, and the donation centers say, we don't have any donations. They would also say that yeah. sometimes they'd, they would, the phone would actually ring for a month, a month and a half. They'd call every day. Finally, somebody would answer the phone. And they'd, and, uh, they'd ask, uh, well, how many donations have you had? They said, five. <laughs> so we went to uh, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and Human Rights in China almost in 2006. Natus and I both have been involved with Amnesty International in Canada, and they basically took a seven-year hold on this. They wouldn't agree that this was happening, and one of them told me privately is that they felt that if they raised this issue, they would lose all ability to lobby to get rid of the death penalty in China. So basically, for seven years, head office for Amnesty then was in London. We were not allowed to get anywhere with Amnesty on this issue. We, we now have Amnesty fully on side with us as of about a year ago. I think Human Rights Watch, is, I'm not quite sure where Human Rights Watch is, but they have come around eventually. And the one thing uh, that, that Matt said uh, I'd like to follow up on is about waiting times. And there are not waiting times for organs, but there are waiting times for beds, because these hospitals are operating at capacity. There aren't enough doctors, there aren't enough beds, there aren't enough hospitals. And there's been this huge building boom of transplant hospitals, and Tianjin's one example of it. And 
how can they be building all this capital unless they're sure that not only there's a huge supply of organs now, but there's an endless supply of organs into the future? And that is one going? of the most striking things that, well, all this supposed debate has been going on. There's been all this hurly-burly and, and, and political play and, and statements from the Chinese about all their reforms and so forth, and we see it not, there's nothing reflected in the actual hospital records. There's nothing but construction, nothing but an endless construction and no signs to be seen within the actual literature of a lack of confidence in the future. Most just creepiest thing is this sense that, well, we're just going to have organs going into the future. A ask David about Wang Jiafu. Well, so Huang Jiafu, the person, how would I describe him? He's the person in charge of the chief reform. Liar, chief liar for the Chief system. liar. Um, so he gives a number of 10,000 transplants a year. How many organ transplants a year did you find in the update? Well, uh, what we did is we didn't have a specific figure. We, we, we did a range uh, between 60,000 and 100,000 a year. So uh, he's saying 10,000, and, and you're 10, saying 60 to 100,000. Yeah, uh, a year, and, and it's increasing over time because of the increasing capacity. So uh, the earlier years maybe it was closer to 60,000, later years closer to uh, 100,000. Wang Jiefu at one time was deputy minister of health. He's the vice chair of the, he the health care committee for the Communist Party. That's very important. Like he's in charge of the to of the health of top party leaders. He's a liver surgeon. So we'll try not to say anything bad. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the function we see him performing is basically he's the public face of the Chinese Communist Party on this issue. And he's constantly making statements uh, about it. And if you track his statements over time, he contradicts himself all the time. I mean, you can point to one thing about it. He says and says, is it true or is it not? But if you look at a bunch of things he says, he's just contradicting himself. So it's, it's, it's just pointless even talking about what he says. <laughs> Matt, I believe you have a story about Huang Jiefu and uh, a liver surgery yeah. he did. Oh, I think Huang Jiefu is great in what he shows us about the system. He did like a, this fancy liver transplant in 2005 in which he ordered two additional livers to be delivered to him personally that, I mean, must have been removed like within 12 or 16 hours of his making the phone call. So he went to Xinjiang, he did a demonstration of, a, of removal of a liver cancer. He found that he could, um, that the operation would, would, was possible to perform an autologous transplant where he removes the liver, removes the cancer and puts it back. In order to do so, he ordered two spare livers. So he called uh, the third military medical university in Chongqing and then his alma mater in um, Guangzhou and got two extra livers like flown on plane to him. How, how did you find out about this story? It's all in Chinese media. There are four articles all about it. Why is it impossible f for a surgeon in the U.S. to order two livers? Well, who are you going to kill? I mean, is that, the, is, that the only, is that the only way to have yeah, a Yeah, either, they, they either have a someone is brain dead in hospital, then there is a period and that liver is allocated, but in th that situation... If you controlled the twilight zone, you could do that. You could arrange the car wrecks perfectly timed and maybe tissue matched ahead of time, and you could pull this off. So someone has to die for there to be an organ. Yeah, it's not just part of the liver, it's the full organ. Yeah, these were full liver transplants. What are the numbers these hospitals are saying they're performing every year? If you add them up, you're getting your figures. Figures are estimates. They're yeah, not they're like estimates. one hospital by one you, hospital, we have the number. Let me give you a fairly simple way of explaining this. It's not a perfectly accurate way, it's a kind of cartoon, but it's a, and it, we actually use a more complex method in the, in the update. But there's a number, I'll give you a number, 146 hospitals who do kidney and liver transplants. It's that, that's not even a perfect number, but these are the ones who are sort of- They were the registered health, approved, yeah. Registered and approved by the Ministry of Health. Right. Well, there are others, but for the sake of argument. For the sake of the argument, the sake of fairly low number. These are just the, the, the high volume places, because it makes it simpler. We're not doing hearts and we're just doing kidneys and livers. Uh, those hospitals tend to have, and you start to see a pattern after looking at this data, and I've been looking at it for quite some time now, you see a pattern of at least two to three, to three or four transplant teams, actually 20 to 30 transplant beds at least, at least. Well, uh, they have well, well, no, no, we'll get to the minimum requirements in a minute, but we don't even have to use those. You can just see this pattern. Uh, and a 20 to 30 day stay, and you send to see 80 to 100% occupancy rates. What do you pull out of that? Well, one way to say is, is it possible that the average transplant center in China, ministry approved, is doing one transplant a day, just one? 
With all this uh, now, staff. Now, with all that staff, two to three transplants a day, and some of them are just sitting around twiddling their thumbs and not doing anything every day. But let's say they do one transplant a day. Well, that gives you a very simple number, 365 times 146, that's 52,000 transplants a year. So we're already at 52,000. Now, the fact is, the Ministry of Health actually demands that they have far more beds than that and a far a larger staff than that. And they quota, actually quoted to it. Well, yeah, they have quotas, but the key thing is that they're asking for a lot more facilities than that. Well, now fair enough. The, the, me, David Kilgore, and David Matus are not in You're walking around uh, China with clipboards, making sure that the Ministry of Health is getting their money's worth here. We're not doing that, so we can't say that that's right. But if it were true, if these hospitals are following the directives of the Ministry of Health that allow them to get that license, they would have to be doing about 80 to 90,000 transplants per year. Yeah, that's the minimum. That's the minimum. And now we haven't even gone into Matt's Tianjin oh. Central Hospital at uh, military four, backed. 4,000 to 5,000. We haven't talked about Beijing 309 Military Hospital. The massive hospital. Yeah, which are way beyond the minimum. Now we're talking 3,000 to 4,000. These are, you know, easily we start coming into these I wish figures. We'd brought, I really wish we'd brought the, the update because it's, uh, it's uh, 700 pages, 2,300 footnotes it's and you know it's just massive and most of it is on these extraordinary hospitals it is mainly about hospitals which do a thousand transplants or over every year and we can just you keep naming them off it's kind of it's mind dumbing actually to look at these. so how is it possible that Huang Jie Fu is saying 10,000 a year and you are the only people researching what seems to be obvious. It is an awful lot of work to go through all these individual hospitals and put together uh, this information sort of bit by bit. With a story like this, why isn't everyone rushing to cover it? Oh, it's had a huge coverage. We, if you look on the, our website, you'll see that we've had, we've had four stories in the New York Times. The Times wouldn't touch this story for, what, six years? Mm. Well, that's the thing. It was, it's been, this story has been out 2006. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ten years later, the New York Times finally writes four articles. What happened? It, I think the answer is partly that it's a complex story, that it involves a lot of different pieces of evidence. There's not, uh, like uh, with some of the examples Matt gave, just sort of one thing you, uh, you can point to. There's, of course, all the contrary communist propaganda. There's censorship in China. People are more concerned about what happens to them in their own neighborhood.